forgotten. Old times are and not forgotten. Look away, look away, look away. Dixieland, in Dixieland, where I was born in early on one frosty morning. Look away, look away, look away. Dixieland. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to A People's Historian, the show where we read about half an hour of history together. My name is Jason Kishinev, and we are about to start Chapter 9 of A People's History of the United States by Howard Zinn. If you like what you heard, or hear, or will hear, or have heard, hit the like and subscribe button and the notification bell so you get notified if I may, when I make a video in the future. Chapter 9, entitled, Slavery Without Submission, Emancipation Without Freedom. The United States government's support of slavery was based on an overpowering practicality. In 1790, a thousand tons of cotton were being produced every year in the South. By 1860, 70 years later, it was a million tons. In the same period, 500,000 slaves grew to 4 million a system harried by slave rebellions and conspiracies developed a network of controls in the southern states backed by the laws, courts, armed forces, and race prejudice of the nation's political leaders. It would take either a full-scale slave rebellion or a full-scale war to end such a deeply entrenched system. If a rebellion, it might get out of hand and turn its ferocity beyond slavery to the most successful system of capitalist enrichment in the world. If a war, those who made the war would organize its consequences. Hence, it was Abraham Lincoln who freed the slaves, not John Brown. In 1859, John Brown was hanged with federal complicity for attempting to do by small-scale violence what Lincoln would do by large-scale violence several years later and slavery. With slavery abolished by order of the government, true, a government pushed hard to do so by blacks free and slave and by white abolitionists, its end could be orchestrated so as to set limits to emancipation. Liberation from the top would go only so far as the interests of the dominant groups permitted, the wealthy elites. If carried further by the momentum of war, the rhetoric of a crusade, it could be pulled back to a safer position. Thus, while the ending of slavery led to a reconstruction of national politics and economics, it was not a radical reconstruction, but a safe one. In fact, a profitable one. The plantation system, based on tobacco growing in Virginia, North Carolina, and Kentucky, and rice in South Carolina, expanded into lush new cotton lands in Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and needed more slaves. But slave importation became illegal in 1808. Therefore, from the beginning, the law went unenforced, says John Hope Franklin. The long unprotected coast, the certain markets, and the prospects of huge profits were too much for the American merchants and they yielded to temptation. He estimates that perhaps 250,000 slaves were imported illegally before the Civil War. How can slavery be described? Perhaps not at all by those who have not experienced it. And that's the truth. The 1932 edition of a best-selling textbook by two northern liberal historians saw slavery as perhaps the Negro's necessary transition to civilization. Economists or cleometricians 
statistical historians, never heard that word, have tried to assess slavery by estimating how much money was spent on slaves for food and medical care. But can this describe the reality of slavery as it was to a human being who lived inside it? Are the conditions of slavery as important as the existence of slavery? John Little, a former slave, wrote, They say slaves are happy because they laugh and are merry. I myself and three or four others have received 200 lashes in the day and had our feet in fetters. Yet at night we would sing and dance and make others laugh at the rattling of our chains. Happy men we must have been. We did it to keep down trouble and to keep our hearts from being completely broken. That is as true as the gospel. Just look at it. Must not we have been very happy? Yet I have done it myself. I have cut capers in chains. A record of deaths kept in a plantation journal, now in the University of North Carolina archives, lists the ages and cause of death of all those who died on the plantation between 1850 and 1855. It's not a very long time period, but certainly would be an interesting document to take a look at. Of the 32 who died in that period, only four reached the age of 60. Four reached the age of 50. Seven died in their 40s. Seven died in their 20s or 30s. And nine died before they were five years old. But can statistics record what it meant for families to be torn apart when a master for profit sold a husband or a wife, a son or a daughter? In 1858, a slave named Abraham Scriven was sold by his master and wrote to his wife, Give my love to my father and mother and tell them goodbye for me. And if we shall not meet in this world, I hope to meet in heaven. One recent book on slavery looks at whippings in 1840 to 1842 on the Barrow Plantation in Louisiana with 200 slaves. The records show that over the course of two years, a total of 160 whippings were administered, an average of 0.7 whippings per hand per year. About half the hands were not whipped at all during the period. One could also say half of all slaves were whipped. That has a different ring. That figure, 0.7 per hand per year, shows whipping was infrequent for any individual. But looked at another way, once every four or five days, some slave was whipped. Barrow, as a plantation owner, according to his biographer, was no worse than the average. He spent money on clothing for his slaves, gave them holiday celebrations, built a dance hall for them. He also built a jail and was constantly devising ingenious punishments, for he realized that uncertainty was an important aid in keeping his gangs well in hand. The whippings, the punishments, were work disciplines. Still, Herbert Gutman finds dissecting Fogel and Angerman's statistics. Overall, four in five cotton pickers engaged in one or more disorderly acts in 1840 to 1841. As a group, a slightly higher percentage of women than men committed seven or more disorderly acts. Thus, Gutman disputes the argument of Fogel and Engerman that the Barrow Plantation slaves became devoted, hard-working, responsible slaves who identified their fortunes with the fortunes of their masters. Slave revolts in the United States were not as frequent or as large scale as those in the Caribbean islands or in South America. 
probably the largest slave revolt in the United States, took place near New Orleans in 1811. Four to five hundred slaves gathered after a rising at the plantation of a Major Andre. Armed with cane knives, axes, and clubs, they wounded Andre, killed his son, and began marching from plantation to plantation, their numbers growing. They were attacked by U.S. Army and militia forces. Sixty-six were killed on the spot, and sixteen were tried and shot by a firing squad. The conspiracy of Denmark Vesey, himself a free Negro, was thwarted before it could be carried out in 1822. The plan was to burn Charleston, South Carolina, then the sixth largest city in the nation, and to initiate a general revolt of slaves in the area. Several witnesses said thousands of blacks were implicated in one way or another. Blacks had made about 250 pike heads and bayonets and over 300 daggers, according to Herbert Apthecker's account. But the plan was betrayed and 35 blacks, including Vesey, were hanged. The trial record itself, published in Charleston, was ordered destroyed soon after publication as too dangerous for slaves to see. Nat Turner's rebellion in Southampton County, Virginia in the summer of 1831 threw the slaveholding South into a panic and then into a determined effort to bolster the security of the slave system. Turner, claiming religious visions, gathered about 70 slaves who went on a rampage from plantation to plantation, murdering at least 55 men, women, and children. They gathered supporters but were captured as their ammunition ran out. Turner and perhaps 18 others were hanged. Did such rebellions set back the cause of emancipation as some moderate abolitionists claimed at the time? An answer was given in 1845 by James Hammond, a supporter of slavery. But if your course was wholly different, if you distilled nectar from your lips and discoursed sweetest music, do you imagine you could prevail on us to give up a thousand millions of dollars in the value of our slaves and a thousand millions of dollars more in the depreciation of our lands? The slave owner understood this and prepared. Henry Tragel says, oh, excuse me, Henry Tragel says, In 1831, Virginia was an armed and garrisoned state, with a total population of 1,211,405. The state of Virginia was able to field a militia force of 101,488 men, including cavalry, artillery, grenadiers, riflemen, and light infantry. It is true that this was a paper army in some ways, and that the county regiments were not fully armed and equipped, but it is still an astonishing commentary on the state of the public mind of the time, during a period when neither the state nor the nation faced any sort of exterior threat. We find that Virginia felt the need to maintain a security force roughly 10% of the number of its inhabitants, black and white, male and female, slave and free. Excuse me. Rebellion, though rare, was a constant fear among slave owners. Ulrich Phillips, a southerner whose American Negro slavery is a classic study, wrote, A great number of southerners at all times held the firm belief that the Negro population was so docile, so little cohesive, and in the main so friendly toward the whites and so contented that a disastrous insurrection by them would be impossible. But on the whole, there was much greater anxiety abroad in the land than historians have told. Eugene Genovese, in his comprehensive study of slavery, Roll Jordan Roll, 
sees a record of simultaneous accommodation and resistance to slavery. The resistance included stealing property, sabotage and slowness, killing overseers and masters, burning down plantation buildings, running away. Even the accommodation breathed a critical spirit and disguised subversive actions. Most of this resistance, Genevieve stresses, fell short of organized insurrection, but its significance for masters and slaves was enormous. Running away was much more realistic than armed insurrection. <clears throat> During the 1850s, about a thousand slaves a year escaped into the north, Canada and Mexico. Obviously, Mexico is not the north. Thousands ran away for short periods, and this despite the terror facing the runaway. The dogs used in tracking for, uh, fugitives bit, tore, mutilated, and if not pulled off in time, killed their prey, Genevieve says. Harriet Tubman, born into slavery, her head injured by an overseer when she was 15, made her way to freedom alone as a young woman, then became the most famous conductor on the Underground Railroad. She made 19 dangerous trips back and forth, often disguised, escorting more than 300 slaves to freedom, always carrying a pistol, tearing the fugitives, you'll be free or die. She expressed her philosophy, there was one of two things I had a right to, liberty or death. If I could not have one, I would have the other, for no man should take me alive. One overseer told a visitor to his plantation that some Negroes are determined never to let a white man whip them and, and will resist you when you attempt it. Of course, you must kill them in that case. One form of resistance was not to work so hard. W.E.B. Du Bois wrote in The Gift of Black Folk, as a tropical product with a sensuous receptivity to the beauty of the world, he was not as easily reduced to be the mechanical draft horse which the northern European laborer became. He tended to work as the results pleased him and refused to work or sought to refuse when he did not find the spiritual returns adequate. Thus he was easily accused of laziness and driven as a slave when in truth he brought to modern manual labor a renewed valuation of life. Ulrich Phillips described truancy, absconding, vacations without leave, and resolute efforts to escape from bondage altogether. He also described collective actions. Occasionally, however, a squad would strike in a body as a protest against severities. An episode of this sort was recounted in a letter of a Georgia overseer to his absent employer. Sir, I write you a few lines in order to let you know that six of your hands has left the plantation every man but Jack. They displeased me with their work and I give some of them a few lashes, Tom with the rest. On Wednesday morning they were missing. The instances where poor whites helped slaves were not frequent, but sufficient to show the need for setting one group against the other. Genevieve says, the slaveholders suspected that non-slaveholders would encourage slave disobedience and even rebellion, not so much out of sympathy for the blacks as out of hatred for the rich planters and resentment of their own property. Poverty, excuse me. Resentment of their own poverty. White men sometimes were linked to slave insurrectionary plots and each such incident rekindled fears. This helps explain the stern police measures against whites who fraternized with blacks. Herbert 
Apthecker. That is a weird last name. Apthecker. Quotes a report to the governor of Virginia on a slave conspiracy in 1802. I have just received information that three white persons are concerned in the plot and they have arms and ammunition concealed under their houses and were to give aid when the Negroes should begin. One of the conspiring slaves said that it was the common run of poor white people who were involved. In return, blacks helped whites in need. One black runaway told of a slave woman who had received 50 lashes of the whip for giving food to a white neighbor who was poor and sick. When the Brunswick Canal was built in Georgia, the black slaves and white Irish workers were segregated. The excuse being that they would do violence against one another. They may well have, that may well have been true, but Fanny Kemble, the famous actress and wife of a planter, wrote in her journal, But the Irish are not only quarrelers and rioters and fighters and drinkers and despisers, despisers of the N-word, they are passionate, impulsive, warm-hearted, Generous people, much given to powerful indignations, which break out suddenly when not compelled to smolder sullenly. Pestilent sympathizers, too, and with a sufficient dose of American atmospheric air in their lungs, properly mixed with the right proportion of ardent spirits. There is no saying, but they might actually take to sympathy with the slaves, and I leave you to judge of the possible consequences. You perceive, I am sure, that they can be, by no means be allowed to work together on the Brunswick Canal. The need for slave control led to an ingenious device, paying poor whites, themselves so troublesome for 200 years of Southern history, to be overseers of black labor and therefore buffers for black hatred. Religion was used for control. A book consulted by many planters was the Cotton Plantation Record and Account Book, which gave these instructions to overseers. You will find that an hour devoted every Sabbath morning to their moral and religious instruction would prove a great aid to you in bringing about a better state of things amongst, amongst the Negroes. As for black preachers, as Genovese puts it, they had to speak a language defiant enough to hold the high-spirited among their flock, but neither so inflammatory as to rouse them to battles they could not win, nor so ominous as to arouse the ire of ruling powers. Practicality decided. <clears throat> the slave communities, embedded as they were among numerically preponderant and militarily powerful whites, counseled the strategy of patience, of acceptance of what could not be helped, of a dogged effort to keep the black community alive and healthy, a strategy of survival that, like its African prototype above all, said yes to life in this world. It was once thought that slavery had destroyed the black family, and so the black condition was blamed on family frailty rather than on poverty and prejudice. Blacks without families, helpless, lacking kinship and identity, would have no will to resist. But interviews with ex-slaves done in the 1930s by the Federal Writers Project of the New Deal for the Library of Congress showed a different story, which jo George Rawick summarizes. The slave community acted like a generalized extended kinship system in which all adults looked after all children and there was little division between my, cho my children for whom I'm responsible and your children for whom you're responsible. A kind of family relationship in which older children have great responsibility for caring for younger siblings is obviously more functionally integrative and useful for slaves than the pattern of sibling rivalry and often dislike that frequently comes out of contemporary middle-class nuclear families composed of high, highly individualized persons. 
Indeed, the activity of the slaves in creating patterns of family life that were functionally integrative did more than merely prevent the destruction of personality. It was part and parcel, as we shall see, of the social process out of which came black pride, black identity, black culture, the black community, and black rebellion in America. Whew, that was kind of a mouthful. Old letters and records dug out by historian Herbert Gutman shows the stubborn resistance of the slave family and pressures of disintegration. A woman wrote to her son for whom she had been separated for 20 years. I long to see you in my old age. Now, my dear son, I pray you to come and see your dear old mother. I love you, Cato. You love your mother. You are my only son. And a man wrote to his wife, sold away from him with their children. Send me some of the children's hair in a separate paper with their names on the paper. I had rather anything that had happened to me than most than ever to have been parted from you and the children. Laura, I do love you the same. Going through records of slave marriages, Gutman found how high was the incidence of marriage among slave men and women and how stable these marriages were. He studied the remarkably complete records kept on one South Carolina plantation. He found a birth register of 200 slaves extending from the 18th century to just before the Civil War. It showed stable kin networks, steadfast marriages, unusual fidelity, and resistance to forced marriages. Slaves hung on determinedly to their selves, to their love of family, their wholeness. A shoemaker on the South Carolina Sea Islands expressed this in his own way. I've lost an arm, but it hasn't gone out of my brains. This family solidarity carried into the 20th century. The remarkable southern black farmer Nate Shaw recalled that when his sister died, leaving three children, his father proposed sharing their care, and he responded, That suits me, Papa. Let's handle them like this. Don't get the two little boys, the youngest ones, off at your house and the oldest one be at my house. And we hold these little boys apart and won't bring them to see one another. I'll bring the little boy that I keep, the oldest one, around to your home amongst the other two. And you forward the others in, to my house and let them grow up knowing that they are brothers. Don't keep them separated in a way that they'll forget about one another. Don't do that, Papa. Also insisting on the strength of blacks even under slavery, Lawrence Levine gives a picture of a rich culture among slaves, a complex mixture of adaptation and rebellion through the creativity of stories and songs. <clears throat> we raise the wheat, they give us the corn. We bake the bread, they give us the crust. We sift the meal, they give us the hus. We peel the meat, they give us the skin, and that's the way they take us in. We skim the pot, they give us the liquor, and say that's good enough for inward. There was mockery. The poet William Cullen Bryant, after attending a corn shucking in 1843 in South Carolina, told of slave dances turned into a pretended military parade a sort of burlesque of our military trainings. Spirituals often had double meanings. The song, O Canaan, Sweet Canaan, I am bound for the land of Canaan, often meant that slaves meant to get to the north, their Canaan. During the Civil War, slaves began to make up new spirituals with bolder messages before I'd be a slave, I'd be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be saved. And the spiritual many thousand go. No more peck of corn for me, no more, no more. 
No more driver's last for me. No more, no more. Levine refers to slave resistance as pre-political, expressed in countless ways in daily life and culture. Ma music, magic, art, religion were all ways, he says, for slaves to hold on to their humanity. He say magic? While southern slaves held on, free blacks in the north, there were about 130,000, in 1830, about 200,000 in 1850, agitated for the abolition of slavery. In 1829, David Walker, son of a slave but born free in North Carolina, moved to Boston where he sold old clothes. The pamphlet he wrote and printed, Walker's Appeal, became widely known. It infuriated southern slaveholders. Georgia offered a reward of $10,000 to anyone who would deliver Walker alive and $1,000 to anyone who would kill him. It is not hard to understand why when you read his appeal. There was no slavery in history, even that of the Israelites in Egypt. What? There was no slavery in history, even that of the Israelites in Egypt. Worse than the slavery of the black man in America, Walker said. Show me a page of history, either sacred or profane, on which a verse can be found which maintains that the Egyptians heaped the insupportable insult upon the children of Israel by telling them that they were not of the human family. Walker was scathing to his fellow blacks who would assimilate. I would wish candidly to be understood that I would not give a pinch of snuff to be married to any white person I ever saw in all the days of my life. <coughs> Blacks must fight for their freedom, he said. Let our enemies go on with their butcheries and at once fill up their cup. Never make an attempt to gain our freedom or natural right from under our cruel oppressors and murderers until you see your way clear. When that hour arrives and you move, be not afraid or dismayed. Excuse me. God has been pleased to give us two eyes, two hands, two feet, and some sense in our heads as well as they. They have no more right to hold us in slavery than we have to hold them. Our sufferings will come to an end in spite of all the Americans this side of eternity. Then we will want all the learnings and talents among ourselves and perhaps more to govern ourselves every dog must have his day the americans is coming to an end one summer day in 1830 david walker was found dead near the doorway of his shop in boston some born in slavery acted out the unfulfilled desire of millions Frederick Douglass, a slave, sent to Baltimore to work as a servant and a laborer in the shipyard, somehow learned to read and write, and at 21 in the year 1838 escaped to the north, where he became the most famous black man of his time as lecturer, newspaper editor, writer. In his autobiography, Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, he recalled his first childhood thoughts about his condition. Why am I a slave? Why are some people slaves and other masters? Was there ever a time when this was not so? How did the relation commence? Once, however, engaged in the inquiry, I was not very long in finding out the true solution of the matter. It was not color, but crime not God, but man, that afforded the true explanation of the existence of slavery. Nor was I long in finding out another important truth, viz. What man can make, make and unmake. I distinctly remember being, even then, most strongly impressed with the idea of being a free man someday. This cheering assurance was an inborn dream of my human nature, a constant menace of slavery, and one which all the powers of slavery 
were unable to silence or extinguish. And I would really like to just end this episode with the words of Frederick Douglass. Thank you for tuning in. Hope you tune in next time. Hit that like and subscribe button if you enjoyed the reading. We'll see you next time.